Okay, so what we're going to talk about today is how the shoulder joint, the glenohumeral joint, can get to the same in position over your head in two different planes and what must have to happen in the frontal plane for it to get to that final destination, okay? What I did is I wrapped Ken with tape to show you that Ken is gonna play the role of the humerus today. So his feet are kind of like the, the, the end of the humerus and his head is kind of like the head of the humerus. And even though his body is facing forward, his head is facing, in this case, to his right. Just like <coughs> the head of the humerus, the ball, okay? Another thing I'd like for you to take into account is the smooth part of the humerus, that's what has to articulate with the smooth part of the socket. On okay, smooth on smooth. Once you start to get to the non-smooth, you can't go any further. You have to articulate smooth on smooth. So in other words, I use the golf ball golf tee, but it's really more like kind of half a golf ball on a golf tee. You, you can't articulate the other part. Once you get to the end of that articulation, you can't go any further. It has to be smooth on smooth. Okay, so far so good. All right, so watch this. I'm going to simulate the socket with my little fingers because it's a lot easier to show you what I'm trying to show you. So here we're in anatomical position. The humerus, his body is facing forward, but the head is turned to the right so that it could fit into the socket. Okay. If we raise our hands in the sagittal plane, <coughs> easy peasy, as my son used to say, before you got too cool for dad, lemon squeezy. Smooth on smooth. No problem when we flex. Smooth on smooth. Okay? If you can't see from where you are, I'll use Ken. The face of Ken is smooth, and the hair on Ken would be rough. We, we can't articulate this part onto the socket. So the flexion would be Good to go, okay? Watch what happens though if we do, I'm gonna start off with Ken because I think the emphasis is gonna be more obvious here. Watch what happens if we try to raise our hands in the frontal plane. Remember, the, the end result's the same place. But watch what happens if we go frontal plane, smooth on, that can't happen. Minus all the silly sound effects. You can't do this, because the ball, the articulating surface will be facing away. <coughs> and I'm gonna show you what we have to do. I'm gonna show you what we do, but it's important to see why we have to do it. Smooth on smooth, bang, we have a problem. That was when your shoulder couldn't go any further. So what our shoulder must do, it's kind of a neat little trick. When we run out of road, what we do is we externally rotate, we reposition the ball so that we can continue down the road. I'll show that as many times as I need. Abduct, we run out of road. But if we externally rotate, we reposition the head so that we could go further on the road. And think about this as well. From here, externally rotate to there is the exact same place as here to there. Here plus this is the exact same as this. So with the shoulder, the real shoulder, we're going to go here, here, reposition that ball, and then we have more room to go up. Make sense? Okay. Everybody, do me a favor and stand up. If you, you don't have to, but I'd like for you to. I think it'll help show what we're talking about here. Okay. 
anatomical position. Okay. Notice your your bicep should be facing forward, should be facing me. Okay. Let's go ahead and put our hands over our head. Okay. Now from here. I'd like for you to slowly adduct and notice where your biceps are facing. It's pretty cool and freaky at the same time, right? Let's try it again. Relax. Let your biceps face forward. Arms up. Slowly bring them back down and notice your biceps should be facing laterally unless you roll them back in on your way down. If you did, don't. How do you think your biceps went from facing forward to facing laterally? It's because you externally rotated on your way up. It's gonna mess with you because your radial ulna joint wants to pronate on the way up, <laughs> so you don't really see it. But remember how I said the radial ulna joint pronates on the way up? That's to actually compensate for the shoulder externally rotating on the way up as well. A lot of students will miss this question because when their arms are over your head, you're like, well, my biceps are facing each other. And when I'm down here and my biceps face each other, I'm internally rotating. That's cool. You're not down here. <laughs> you're up here and they're facing each other because you were externally rotating. Just like when I take the spoon and I flex, the front of the spoon is now facing the back, it's kind of the same thing. The heads are facing out, but when I flip them over, whoa, they're seeing each other again. But that had nothing to do with the rotation in terms of internal and external, it had everything to do with the adduction. Okay, let me see. Yes, ma'am. And here's one way to look at it. If Ken, if Ken is here, and let's say, well, Ken would be the head. Let's say uh, Ken's um, abs represent the bicep, okay? So Ken is my shoulder, right? His abs are the bicep. What I'm trying to show you is that when Ken does this and this, when he comes down, you're facing that way because he had to externally rotate on the way up. That makes sense? So, abduction. You can abduct without externally rotating, but you can only do it so much until you run out of articulating surface. Bless you. This isn't, a, this isn't a planet. This doesn't have ball all the way across where <laughs> you could do it. You only have so much articulating surface before you have to reposition to continue down the path of articulating surface. Make sense? Okay. I think this can be seen, because I'm gonna ask some questions like this. Um, with the upright row, if you kind of do it slow enough, so let's say my biceps are facing in, so like I would be you know, internally rotated here. But when I upright row and I bring it up to my, to my chin, my biceps are facing forward. I went from here to there. Because I, you can even see my bicep externally rotating as I bring it up. And to counter the shoulder externally rotating, that's why my radial ulna joint is gonna have rotation as well. So that links, when we did that example in class, well, why does the radial ulna joint have to supinate on our way up? Functionally, is to keep our fingers under the bar, but it's also to counter the rotation of the shoulder that needs to externally rotate to reposition the head of the humerus onto the socket. It's a harder to see version of why we cancel out elbow and shoulder when we're trying to make something go straight. Because the elbow's trying to make my hand sling this way and my shoulder's trying to make my hand sling this way, but when they happen at the same time, it makes my hand go straight. So if I'm trying to lift the bar straight and I have one joint that's trying to take me this way, I need something else that's trying to spin me the other way 
And when they worked together, it could keep me pulling on the bar straight up. Okay? So that was the key point of today's lecture. I mean, we're going to continue on unless you guys have some questions. But the key point in today's lecture is that if you go sagittal, no problem at all. No problem at all. But if you go frontal, you have to spin. Ken has to spin. I just made that up. Copyright. Ken has to spin in order to get you to the same place. Question. Um, so can you always use the bicep as a landmark? Absolutely. Uh, yes. You know, there, I have no problem with landmarks that are consistent, and the bicep is a great landmark for your humerus. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, the bicep is also a landmark for already on the joint too, right? So it's kind of like a good landmark for both. So on the test, the test, it's going to be important to know that when you abduct, you have to eventually externally rotate in order for you to abduct 30 more degrees, a little bit further, okay? It doesn't have to. It, it depends on like if you grip in something or holding on to something. So like if um if if I had individual, I think this should should make sense if I do my job. If you had a dumbbell, like two dumbbells that are totally independent of each other, technically I could supinate one and pronate the other. But when you have a bar, I can't independently <laughs> pronate and supinate. Like I'm I'm closing that road. So they have to kind of move together. Um, functionally, though, it makes sense because you don't want to stay pronated or, the, or now the, the thumbs are going to be holding the bar. You're going to lose all these little piggies that could be holding the bar. So the supination actually happens so that your fingers could stay under the bar. A to B, that was no radial on a joint motion. B to C gets me with my fingers under the bar. And that radial on a joint rotation is to counteract the shoulder externally rotating as I bring everything up. Um, God, there was something I don't know, I'm afraid. So abduction, remember in the hip, sockets perspective, long bones perspective, that's just to show you that it doesn't matter what rotation my shoulder is doing, if I'm going up in my sockets from a plane, that's still called abduction. Like, imagine how silly that would be if, if flexion was like to the bicep, and so we're gonna go ab, 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 abduction, external rotation, flexion, you know? Like, like you're, you're still in the lateral flexion plane, so it's still abduction, regardless of the position of the humerus in its transverse plane. So this would still be ab 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 Okay. Remember from Wednesday, you kind of have this global ab and ad, meaning functionally you should be able to get your hands at 180, but that's not what's happening in the in the joint. The joint is about 120 of glenohumeral and the other 60 is the scapula leaning or rotating to get your hand up over your head, okay? So practically speaking, it's okay when you're doing, you know, assessments of people to, to but you have to know how much of what is what they, and that's what they call scapular um, uh, uh, rhythm, a glenoscapular rhythm, glenohumeroscapular rhythm. One of those is correct. Check this out. This is where, if you're a visual learner, YouTube is so great. Anybody watch Loki last night? Alright, play it cool, I'll show it. Talk later. Let's see. Good on humans. Alright, check this out. Let's see if we can visualize it, and so that way we can show you. Do you see the rotation that has to happen? 
And do you see how the scapula is leaning? Lean. Now, I'm not going to hold you accountable to all those different degrees and stuff. That's grad school. Um, my job is to show you how you get extra motion for your hands, which are important to us as humans, but it's not all coming from the ball about the socket. It, the ball and socket already gives you enough. If, if all that motion came from there, we, we would have a lot more shoulder problems. It's the fact that our pelvic girdle in our upper extremity is split into two shoulder girdles that can independently move. And so my right can do left lateral and my left can do right lateral independently of each other. They don't have to work in tandem. My left can do right transverse and my right can do left transverse independent of each other. My right can do anterior and my right can do posterior. It's super similar, but they can independently move. They don't have to move in one bucket. That makes sense? Stand up if you want. Let's do a um, let's do a, a, a movement uh, practice. Okay, this is what I'd like for you to do. Anatomical. Try to pronate and internally rotate as much as you can. So your hand should be facing out. Your thumb should be facing the back of it. Okay. Now also try to depress your scapula as much as you can. Scapula down. Now raise your arms to your side and see how far you can go. Okay? It's kind of weird, huh? All right, now relax your arms again. Now don't even think about all the interscap. Just raise your hands as you would over your head and look at the difference, right? So in other words, when you had to stay internally rotated, you didn't really have much room to go. But when you were allowed to naturally externally rotate, you could get it all the way up to the top. And to me, the best way to see it, because it is tricky, because you're, you're, again, your biceps are facing each other up here, is when you're up here, bring it back down, and that should be able to show you how your bicep went from facing forward to now facing lateral. Does that make sense? To me, that's the best way to do it. Because if you look at it as, well, my biceps are facing each other up here, and down here when they're facing each other, I'd have to internally rotate. That's going to mess with you. Okay? <laughs> it's going to mess with you. So what, what would have to happen is you'd be like, well, why wouldn't this be? But you have to bring it back down, and that's actually where you still are lateral. Okay? All right. Do we have any follow-up questions for what we've talked about so far with the shoulder? Yes, ma'am. What's the correlation between the biceps facing out and the thumb being lateral? Because I know that whenever the thumb is lateral, it's like about the radial joint mm -hmm. wrapping. Is there like a correlation between the two? Um, there is. Let's see how I can put this. But could we use that instead of the bicep? You can't. Okay. But 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 I'm trying to. That's what I was trying to dig for is to show you why you can't. You. So I can I can move my thumb via my radial ulna joint to go medial lateral or line up right. But my radial ulna joint plane, like so. Let's say I'm in my radial ulna joint's transverse. But uh, let's say I'm in your frontal, right here. My shoulder can be in your transverse while my radial ulna joint, they don't have to necessarily line up in the same plane, so that can mess with people. What I like about the bicep, though, is that the bicep can serve both functions as, as, as its own reference. Let me see if I can make some sense of that. So because the bicep 
is going to kind of follow the humerus. The bicep, if you remember, is like in the middle, right? So we have medial, lateral, in the middle. The bicep's fixed position is serving as a reference for the thumb. The bicep's moving position is serving as a reference of the humerus. But I can go internal and supinate. I can go internal and pronate. I can go internal and not move at all. So the spin of the humerus is just kind of its own thing to the radio ulna, right? So I, I, I don't mind using landmarks, but we, we, can't, we can't use the landmarks like two jumps. <laughs> like we can't like make the, the radio ulna joint somehow correspond to the shoulder joint because we're skipping the stuff that's in the middle. Um, I hope that answered that, that question. It was a great question. I hope I, I answered it as best I could. Um, so the bicep, like sometimes I'll do like little silly things, but I'll take like my pin and make a little mark, or I'll take like um, my pin and plant it like a flag and where you can see. I think I did that on my thigh, because it, it's the same type of bone. Or like you have your thumb planted as your flag and you can see the external rotation happen when you cross your legs. External, internal. So it's similar. Or you could have that flag that's represented by your bicep and you could go internal or external. So like when, when, I'm, when you do an upright row, I think that's an easy way to see it where when you're here and you do this, you can see how it went from here there. All right. To show you the elegance of the shoulder joints. Billy Wagner um, he pitched uh, for a lot of teams, pitched with Houston, the Mets. Um, he started out right-handed, broke his arm, then as a kid taught himself to pitch left-handed because he wanted to still play ball while his arm healed. And uh, five foot 10, and in the 90s, he was throwing 97, 100 miles an hour. In, in throwing, it's not, well, NBA season started, so like, NBA players are so tall and long, like you could see their natural gifts. Like if Shaq, I saw Shaq at the mall, I'd be like, that guy probably plays basketball. Uh, who's the, the rookie for uh, the Spurs? Uh, Victor, uh, like seven five, and like as the wingspan of it, like amazing length, you could see their gifts. If Simone Biles came in, one I'd be like totally fanboying out, but She's small, very small. That helps when you're trying to do 10 flips in the air, right? Okay. Pitchers, throwers, their gifts aren't obvious. Their gift is that their shoulder joint window of rotation is in a different window than other people, than, than re regular people. They're the five to 10% that can take their catapult and bring it past what normal people can bring it. It looks like his forearm is, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm gonna actually show you another picture whose forearm looks like parallel with the ground. I try to do that without cheating, without leaning back, like it's tough to bring it. Back. It's even harder for him because he's actually leaning his trunk forward. So his trunk is here and yet his forearm is back there. In science, we call that a freak of nature. Why we can't see this is because our eyes can't process the frames per second. So if you've ever watched baseball or softball, you're seeing the ball, you're seeing the ball, you're seeing the ball, you're seeing the ball, and all of a sudden it's a blur, and the ball's out at 100 miles an hour. Well, not for me, like 75. It happens so fast, we can't see that. It took high-speed cameras. In fact, 
just to show you the advancement of biomechanics, we didn't even know that horses galloped with periods of unsupport, meaning they're flying through the air in certain periods until we had high-speed cameras to be able to see. Like, oh my gosh, there's no period in time where the hoofs are on the ground when they're flying through the air. We didn't even know that. It happens too fast. Check out this one. That's external rotation of the shoulder. That is taking a spoon at a family reunion and taking a pea and cocking it back to sling it at your cousin to take them off. And some catapults go back further than others. So one of the misconceptions when I was a kid, uh, and I had dreams of pitching one day like a lot of kids do, is, well, anyone can throw hard. It's all in your form. It's all in your mechanics. It's all in, one, one guy told me it was all in your hips, like, uh, uh, what's the movie with uh, Adam Sandler, uh, Happy Gilmore? All in the chubs. This is just like Shaq being born seven feet. You have to be born. Now, you can develop it, but you have to be born and develop that window of external rotation. Now, what's their trade-off? You know what their trade-off is? They can't internally rotate like I can, but unfortunately, there's no sport where I gotta throw behind me. So their internal rotation stops sooner. They have the same window of shoulder motion, but their window is shifted from the development of their glenohumeral joint and, and, and scalp, okay? But this is the secret to how throwers can chunk it so fast. They can bring that catapult back further than us. Yes, there's other things involved, uh, you know, twitch and fiber type. Like I, like I tell my biomechanics students, to make the car go fast, you gotta have two things. You gotta, gotta have a good engine, but more importantly than that, you gotta have road. My Honda Civic, back in the day, when I had a beat up little Honda Civic, it could go 100 miles an hour if you give it enough road. Right? So you have to have engine and you have to have road. Some people have the road but no engine. Some people have the engine and no road. Can you imagine a bodybuilder trying to throw a baseball? I saw it because my college, the first doctoral student at Auburn, Chip, Chip played baseball at Georgia. He was a catcher. And then all of a sudden, Chip got into bodybuilding. And Chip was, he's one of those guys where like his earlobes rested on his traps. Like he was just, and Chip couldn't scratch his back. And so like we played intramural softball and so um, we're slinging it around and Chip's like, <laughs> this is a guy who used to be a catcher, right? So I'm not saying that like working out is bad for throwing, I'm just saying that Chip got bigger engine but he lost road. And if you don't have road, you could have the, 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 the best car in the world engine wise but if it stays in the garage, it's not gonna go fast. So you have to have engine and you have to have rope. Um, and what's more important is rope. Got to have range of motion, got to have rope. Um, so that's, that's the secret. Watch um, some of these, uh, what I love about hard throwers is they can come tall, short, meaty, skinny. Um, this, this guy used to be a man for years and years and years. Um, you know, it, he led the majors in, Jacob DeGrom led the majors in pitches over 100 miles an hour by a starting pitcher. And I mean, he is a coat rack of a human, like, but boy, can his shoulder rotate. You know, he's not wiry, long, and has a lot of motion. So what's the trade-off for having that kind of motion at your shoulder? It's gotta be, you got, there's gotta be some, something you gotta give up. That dude is always hurt. Always hurt. So sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes that's the price you pay. Or in baseball, how many Tommy John surgeries, like he's on his third Tommy John surgery since high school. That's the price you pay for having a catapult <laughs> that works very, very, very well. All right.
is do something like this. One last time. Stand up. Cervical flexion, chin to chest. Cervical extension, chin away from chest. Okay, back to neutral. Right ear, right shoulder, right lateral cervical bending. Left ear, left shoulder, left lateral cervical bending. Okay, back to neutral. Look to your right. Right transverse cervical rotation. Look to your left. Left transverse cervical rotation. Then we have the nuances, the semantics. Right transverse to, right transverse from, left transverse to, left transverse from. Okay? Any questions about cervical movement options? Yes, ma'am. Like, you know like Say that one more time. Left transverse cervical rotation. You went from not looking at to looking at your left shoulder, and the only way that's going to happen is either the top of the slinky moves or the bottom of the slinky moves if you get to the same place. Good question. Any other questions about cervical before we go to trunk? Trunk follows the same rules as cervical, just in a different place, right? So trunk flexion, sternum to pubis, like a crunch. Trunk extension, going away. Right shoulder, right hip, right lateral. Left shoulder to left hip, left lateral. Twist your trunk to the right, right transverse. Sternum to right hip, twist your trunk to the left, left transverse, okay? While we are here, let's do one of these, one of these illusions. Try to keep your sternum looking forward and twist your pelvis to the left, left transverse pelvic girdle rotation. Do you see how your trunk had to twist to the right? Your sternum is looking at your right hip. You'd have to twist to the left to go home. You had to twist to the right when you left home. Right transverse pelvic girdle rotation, go to the other extreme. That's the left transverse trunk. Cool? All right? Any questions about trunk options? Flexion extension, right left lateral. Bending, right left transverse, okay? Wrist. Let's go bilateral wrist flexion, okay? Bilateral wrist extension, okay? Let's go back and do flexion. Now I want you to take your left radial ulna joint and pronate it. Notice how you're still flexed. Just because one set of fingers facing forward and another set facing back doesn't change the fact that you're bilaterally flexed, okay? All right, back to neutral. Let's go right wrist ulna deviation only. Right wrist ulna, so pinky side, deviate to the pinky, okay? Let's go left radial deviation, deviate to the thumb side, okay? Let's go bilateral ulna, bilateral radial, okay? Let's flex the elbows, bilateral ulna, bilateral radial, okay? Let's take the right radial ulna joint and pronate it. So your left hand should be facing up and your right hand should be facing down. I want you to show me what bilateral ulna deviation would look like in this position. To the pinky side, right? To the ulna. Look like this. Sometimes they may look like a mirror. But if you flip the fingers around, going to the pinky ulna side is going to look like that. That's okay. The wrist doesn't know any better. It's just doing what the wrist does. Okay? All right? Let's go back uh, anatomical, flex our elbows here, go right radial on the joint pronation. Okay? Go left radial on the joint pronation. Go bilateral radial on the joint supination to midway, so semi pronated position. Good? Okay? From here, do left shoulder internal rotation. Okay? Left shoulder external rotation. Good. So, go back to anatomical. So we have wrist flexion extension, radial ulna deviation. Any questions about those? Elbow, we have flexion extension. Radial ulna joint, all we have is pronation and supination, but the reason it jacks so much stuff up is because it repositions our whole hand as it goes along for the rod. Okay? Let's see if we can do um, some of our illusion questions like we did last time, okay? So anatomical position, 
abduct all the way over and keep your hands facing forward. Okay? And from there, I'm hoping you can see how your radial ulna joints had to have pronation. You see that? Okay? And your shoulders, when you went up, had to externally rotate. Another common miss on the test is if I start here and I do something like this, some students will miss that because in their mind they're like, well, both shoulders went to the midline. Because in their mind they're using things like away from the midline towards the midline. So did both shoulders do the same thing? No. Right shoulder did ababababa and left shoulder did adadadadada. They're not in the same place, so they couldn't have done the same thing. Does that make sense? Okay. Scapula, let's do some scapula stuff. Shrug up. What is that? Okay, of what? The shoulder? Scapula, good, scapula elevation. Don't put shoulder elevation on the test, okay? It's coming, I'm telling you it's coming. Back down, depression. Protraction is going to be like rounding your shoulders forward. Retraction is going to be like uh, when my mom used to smack me upside the head and correct me on my posture. Shoulders back. But do you see how that could be misleading? Shoulders back. It's really your scapula, right? The shoulder's just going along for the ride. I can't take my shoulder joint and, excuse me, I've got to go back. Okay? So again, we've got, to be, we've got to be weary of these common terms that are used in everyday activities like shoulders back, shoulders up. And, okay. Talk to me about scapular rotation. Okay, have a seat. I'm going to give you an example of, that we can analyze. Okay, talk to me about this motion. Let's see. I'm trying to do it before and after. Oh, this will work. Guys, so talk to me. Oh, sorry, I didn't see that up before. Why is it so tough to find new pictures? All right, that kind of looks like me. Can everybody see that? So, look, guys, we're not. We're, we're trying to keep it simple. Just tell me shoulder movement. And how I'm going to clarify if there's any kind of hint that it's some combo movement is plane. You know, so tell me shoulder motion in its frontal, in the frontal plane of the shoulder. So we're looking at avid head. If I say sagittal component of the shoulder, we're looking at flexion and extension. Okay, that kind of stuff. See if you can link up shoulder with scapula. So when he goes from left to right, he pulls the bar down. And, and today I'm going to end with one of the biggest track trick questions that we have and it's not our fault so this is commonly called a lat pull down bar is coming down right so from left to right the shoulders are going to have adduction and the scapula is going to have downward rotation when he brings the bar up or lets the bar go up it's going to be the opposite it's going to be abduction and upper rotation cool i'm going to tell you why this is confusing because the name of this exercise, which I'm not saying they should change it, it is what it is, but lat pull down, actually you have the same movements and the same muscles as a pull up. So that's what jacks with people. Um, so let's do a, a pull up example. And just, just the change of up and down messes with people. Because in your brain, you're like, well, all the ups should be the same, and all the downs should be the same. 
But for the pull up, when you come up, you're actually gonna have the same movement as when you pulled the bar down. It should kind of be common sense, but we get brainwashed so much with these ups and downs of these exercises that we think they have to be different motions or they have to be different muscles. So from left to right, as he brings his body up, you're gonna have adduction of the shoulders and downward rotation of the scapula. And then as he lowers his body down, you're gonna have upward rotation of the scapula and adduction of the shoulders. Does that make sense? Well, it depends if we're going up or down. So if we're going up, if we're pulling ourselves up, we're gonna have that downward rotation. And I'm, I'm saying that not to make fun of you, that's how my brain has to separate When he was lowering himself down, you're going to have up, 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 and up, 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 rotation. Okay, guys, this is going to be a question on the test in some capacity. Can you repeat that? Sure. So from left to right, when when he's pulling himself up, you're going to have bilateral shoulder adduction and downward rotation of the scapula complement. When he's lowering himself down, you're going to have upper rotation of the scapula and abdomen of the shoulder. Now, some of you may be like, won't you also have depression and elevation? Yeah, but it's the upper and downward rotation that's going to reposition the socket significantly so that you can get your hands up. The downward rotation would be from left to right, that's correct. And then the upper would be from right to left. And so then with the downward, it's going to be add? Add up. Add. Add with down. Yeah. Yeah. Think, think of it like this. We, we started off by saying when I add, or basically when I bring my arms up, when I bring my hands up, my scapula has to upwardly rotate to reposition. So with up, now again, it's not globally up. That's that's why I spend so much time te teaching these references. Up is not necessarily global, it's relative to your body. So like when he's lowering himself down, technically his hands are going up relative to his body, right, locally. So that's what could be, you know, a nasty confusion is, but the hands aren't going up or down. Well, it is relative to his body. So in other words, from here, to there is the exact same as from here to there. That makes sense. Okay. All right, guys, y'all have a safe weekend. Y'all let me know if y'all have any follow-up questions.